Greetings class. Uh, welcome to our next lesson in ocean circulation. Um, and we're still focusing on the stratification of the ocean and how it's separated into the two layers. In the previous lesson we went over the how um, what are the characteristics of physical phenomena that go into formation of the surface ocean. And in, in this uh, le mini lesson we'll do um, the formation of the deep layer um, and then how the surface ocean and the deep layer circulate in order to cause what we call um, the global phenomenon, the global circulation pattern, the largest scale circulation pattern of the ocean, and we call that thermal haline circulation, and we'll see why that is now. So if remember the surface ocean gets heat from the sun, fresh water from rain, and runoff from the land, Whoops! and then the wind mixes that whole layer so that we have a uniformly warm, fresh, less dense surface layer. So what about the deep layer? How does the deep water form? Because um, <clears throat> without this formation, we still wouldn't have both separate layers. We would still just have sort of a gradient from warmer, fresher water down to cold, cooler, salty water. We wouldn't have that definite stratification of the two layers. The deep layer forms at the coldest points in the globe. So looking at this, this profile here, we have uh, the South Pole here, and then we have a uh, latitudinal cross section through the ocean. Okay, this could be the Pacific Ocean, this could be the Atlantic Ocean, um, but let's call it the Atlantic because um, that's where a lot of this water forms. So up here we have the North Pole, right, the Arctic, and down here we have the South Pole, the Antarctic, and in both the poles we have super, super cold um, temperatures. So that super, super cold temperatures makes the water in the surface, so the cold temperatures are at the surface, and it causes those temperatures of the surface water to be very, very cold. And we know that the colder the water, the more dense the water. So that's number one. Number two, it's cold enough to get ice formation, right? We have lots of ice in the Arctic and in the Antarctic, and we know that when salt water freezes, the, the, the ice becomes fresh water, right? And then we have salting out, or deposition of the salt out of that fresh water. So all the salt that used to be in this ice is now dumped into the remaining liquid water, which makes this have a relatively higher concentration of salt. So we have extra cold, more dense, extra salt, even more dense. So at the poles and the surface um, water of the very extreme cold areas of the globe, we have the most densest seawater um, on Earth, the densest parts of the ocean. It's so dense that it sinks. This high density patch of water sinks, then we have more formation, keeps sinking, continual sinking of water, right? Cold, salty water, continually sinking. It follows along the seafloor. Um, essentially continually, we'll just follow the seafloor basin. Okay. When this happens in the North Atlantic, it forms a huge body of um, deep water f f um, formation that we call the North Atlantic deep water. It also happens in parts of the Antarctic, where it's super, super cold. Uh, it gets super, super salty. And so we get this high-density water continually, always forming, always forming. So it's always sinking water. It's always sinking. It's always traveling the, fl the sea floor. And as a matter of fact, it's colder and saltier in the Antarctic than it is in the Arctic, so it's heavier than the North Atlantic deep water, so it'll layer kind of like this. It'll actually run underneath the North Atlantic deep water, but it does collide. The water travels along the seafloor, travels along the seafloor. It can collide with other water masses. It can collide with land masses. It can collide with... Um, um, with anything, with, with, with any any kind of obstruction which drives the water upward now, right? So we have a collision, we have a convergence of water masses that drives this water upwards towards the surface. As it comes towards the surface, what happens? It has to, whoops, sorry, forgot my animation, right? Collides, drives towards the surface. As it comes towards the surface, so we've gotten away from the poles now, away from the cold areas, um, it drives towards the surface, and it has to diverge and go somewhere, right? But also as it gets towards the surface, it gets heated, becomes less dense, starts to get fresh water inputs, so it becomes even less dense, and we get this divergence of our surface water, right? This Now this is contributing to the surface layer of the ocean, which is continually or eventually will always circulate back to the poles, where it will then cool off and become deep water formation again. So we have this continual circulation 
of this deep water formation, surface water formation. Deep water formation, surface water formation. And essentially, the deep water formation happens at the poles where it's super cold. Surface water happens at the, um, you know, as you get closer to the equator. And so we have this constant circulation between the polar regions where we get deep water formation and we get cooling, so loss of heat from the water and then towards the equatorial regions where it's really really warm and there's a lot of heat here so we have this warm water transferring towards the poles cold water transferring towards the equator and that's just a continual circulatory pattern of course it's not as simple as just those two water formations depending on whether or not um, you're cl really close to the poles or we have um, so here we have, this is actually the same profile but flipped around. We have the North Pole over here and the South Pole over here. So you see we have North Water, Atlant North Atlantic Deep Water Formation, Antarctic Bottom Water Formation, and those can layer, layer in on top of each other. But as you get further away from the Antarctic, you can have another deep water formation. It's not quite as cold, it's not quite as salty, so that kind of layers in on top of here. You can have um, another other types of water formation that's not quite as as dense and that can layer in here and we do actually see this in the ocean we get all these different layers of deep water formation um, here's another depiction of that of the various types of deep water formation and the the salinity and temperature of these different bodies of deep water um, are, are distinct enough that if we send a CTD down through here and get a cross section we can actually tell what water mass we're in de depending on the on the salt and temperature and we do that with something called the TS plot so if we plot the temperature on over here and the salinity over here we get isobars or lines of constant um, uh, measurement and these measurements happen to be density so if we were to drop um, a CTD down through one of these we could track the density and know the temperature and the salinity and say oh you know this is Atlanta Antarctic intermediate water because it's this salinity and this de this temperature and this density and we know this is North Atlantic deep water because it's got um, these characteristics and Antarctic bottom water is a little colder and a little bit saltier and so and so we do this and that's how we track water formation now what are the consequences for this circulation, this co continual movement of cold water through the deep um, towards the equator and warm water towards the poles in the surface? Well, if we look at how the sun warms the earth, right, the rays, the sun is large enough and far enough away that the rays of the sun hit the earth basically at these straight parallel angles. So the rays that hit flat or directly at the equator are going to have a stronger incidence of light or a stronger heating effect than as you go towards the poles. As you go towards the poles, the sun will tend to deflect off or wrap around and refract around the earth, but it won't hit at a, di at a flat angle, at a 90 degree angle like this. It'll hit at a stronger angle, and so it'll kind of deflect off these parts of the earth. The effect of that is when this incoming solar radiation comes, we get very hot towards the equator and a little bit cooler, you see by this green color, as you get towards the poles. More direct light, hotter. Indirect light with reflection, cooler. So what does that do for the, the Earth's global heat budget? Well, if you look at this um, map and we have heat, amount of heat, so I, I have it marked as heat flux in watts per meter squared, so that's just basically amount of heat energy versus latitude on our Earth. So again, here's the South Pole, here's the North Pole, and that would put the equator right here. If we measure the influx of heat, which is essentially how much heat the Earth is gaining at the equator, the influx is very, very high, and the heat loss is high but lower than the influx. As you get towards the poles, so if we go this way or this way, the influx of heat decreases. So does the efflux, but the influx of heat decreases faster than the efflux. So the loss of heat here is higher at the poles than the gain of heat, and the gain of heat in the equator is higher than the loss of heat. So what that would mean if there were no kind of temperature regulation on the surface of the Earth, that would mean that the equator would be continually gaining heat, so always getting hotter, never finding an equilibrium. And that would make today living at the equator impossible. It would be way too hot to live. And it would make the poles 
so cold because they would be continually um, getting colder, never finding a, a bottom point, but continually losing 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 heat. Now we know that the poles are very cold, um, and you keep, but but we can still live there with 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 the right uh, gear and the right preparations. But if we did not have thermal regulation on the Earth, then then it would be impossible to do so. Even then, it would be completely unlivable. The reason that we have regulation is this thermal haline circulation. So if we take um, the deep water formation that we learned about and think of it in terms of this transfer of heat, constantly moving cold towards the equator, constantly moving um, heat towards the poles through the surface water, and then we stretch this out across <clears throat> what it really looks like across the entire ocean, we have deep water formation here, deep water formation here, right along Antarctica, and mostly up in in the North Atlantic. And then we have it follows the sea floor here, follows the sea floor here, right until it hits. Most of it will surface either here in the Indian Ocean or it will make its way to the Pacific where it surfaces, and that's where this occurs, right? The warming and the spreading, the warming and the spreading, and then it transfers through the surface ocean um, as warm water. So deep water's in blue, surfaces, becomes warmer, and heads back towards the poles so that it can become cold water again. Now this is continually moving that excess heat, if we look at our heat budget, this excess heat away from our equator in the surface water, and that excess cold in the Arctic and Antarctic regions continually towards uh, so this excess cold continually towards the equator, and that's what makes our Earth livable. This constant thermal haline circulation, and we call that cir we we, um, we nickname this circulation the conveyor belt because it's continually running and it's continually regulating the Earth's temperature. And this is the primary driver of what regulates the Earth's temperature into a in um, a habitable world, so a world where we can live. Um, it's that's in part anyway, um, and a atmospheric circulation also plays a role, and um, and we'll learn about that later and and put the two together so that you have the complete picture. So without this continually cooling, this continual ice formation um, in the poles, at both the North Pole and the, and the South Pole, we would not have deep water formation. Without deep water formation, we would not have thermohaline circulation or the or the conveyor belt. And without thermohaline circulation, so read the name. Let's break down this name. Thermo meaning heat, haline meaning salt. So because of temperature and salt density differences, we get this circulation, thermohaline circulation. And without that, um, the 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 Earth would not have as balanced a global heat budget as it does, um, and the poles in the equator would be at such extreme cold and hot temperatures that the Earth would be basically unlivable. Okay, thanks for joining me. See you next lesson where we see some of the consequences of this, and 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 the consequences of um, of this circulation on uh, or organic matter in the ocean.